Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory linear algebra based on my book, Retrolinear. The subject of this lecture is eigenspaces and the relationship to diagonalizability, and then we will give a number of examples. So let's get started. And I'm going to start right away by telling you what an eigenspace is. So you start with a vector space and um, you have a linear operator. That means a linear transformation from the vector space to itself. And um, you pick a scalar, your favorite scalar, doesn't matter what the scalar is. And uh, you define V sub lambda to be all the vectors in, uh, in V such that T of X is lambda X. Now this looks like the definition of an eigenvector, except this is, this is a little bit more than an eigenvector. It's X is an eigenvector, but it also could be zero. So T of zero is always zero, and that's always lambda of zero, regardless of what lambda is. So regardless of whether or not lambda is an eigenvalue or not, V sub lambda, it has elements in it. It always has zero in it. All the other elements in it are eigenvectors of um, lambda, if lambda is an eigenvalue and has eigenvectors. So this V lambda is called the eigenspace of T belonging to lambda. And you can define this regardless of whether or not lambda is an eigenvalue or not. Any scalar you like, you can decide what V lambda is because V lambda will never be an empty set. It will always include uh, the zero vector if nothing else. But whenever we have a definition for uh, linear operators, we also have a definition for n by n square matrices. We have seen this in previous videos over and over again, that we can go back and forth between linear transformations and matrices, and those are almost the same, the, 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 the different names for the same thing. So if you have an a, n by n matrix, and I'm, I'm now assuming that it's um, with, real co with real entries, but if, it, if the entries were in any other field, it would work just as well. So you pick a scalar lambda, and, and then you pick all the elements in Rn such that Ax equals lambda x. If you pick something in a different field, then x would not be in Rn, would be in Fn. But um, all, the element, all the vectors x such that A times x is a multiple of, uh, is lambda times x uh, for that particular lambda, then that's, um, uh, that's, that, that's actually the same as the null space of that lambda i minus A. Um, we've seen this also before. You can take ax to the other side instead of ax equals lambda x you can have lambda x minus ax equals zero then um, you can write that as lambda identity minus a times x uh, equals zero and so finding all the x in rn such that a x equals lambda x is the same as finding the null space of lambda identity minus s a this is an n by n matrix also another name for the null space is the kernel and so this set is also the kernel of lambda i minus a and this is called the eigenspace of A belonging to lambda. Okay, so, and these two are corresponding definitions. If you start with a matrix T and find its uh, linear transformation T, sorry, and find its matrix with respect to some basis, then the eigenspaces will correspond. Okay, so uh, the reason we look at eigenspaces is the following proposition. And I'm gonna prove this as we go along. So remember, you have a vector space, you have a linear operator and you have a scalar. So, so these are the ingredients you need for this proposition. You start with your linear transformation from a vector space to itself, and you've got this one scalar that you're interested in. And that scalar, you don't have to know anything about it. It doesn't have to be that that's an eigenvalue, just a scalar. Then, first of all, this eigenspace is a subspace. And this is why we think of eigenspaces, because then we can use the machinery and vocabulary of vector spaces to talk about them. And for example, we can talk about their dimension. So why is it a subspace? Um, uh, that, that's pretty straightforward. How do you prove something in a subspace? You have to pr prove that it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication and has the zero vector. Clearly it has the zero vector because T of zero is zero and zero is lambda times zero. So the zero vector is always in V lambda, regardless of what lambda is. Now, why is it closed under addition? If X and Y are in V lambda, that means T of X is lambda X and T of Y is lambda Y. So then what's T of X plus Y? Well, T of X plus Y, because T is a linear transformation, is T of X plus T of Y. But T of X is lambda X, T of Y is lambda Y. You factor a lambda and get lambda times X plus Y. So what, what I just said, and you should write it down yourself, 
is that t of x plus y is lambda times x plus y, which means that x plus y is also in the lambda. Um, and you can, the same thing, the same argument works for scalar multiplication, showing that eigenspaces are always a subspace. And that's why we didn't say eigenspace of v lambda is all, just all the eigenvectors associated with lambda, because we wanted to throw in zero, and zero is not an eigenvector. Uh, so v lambda has that extra element, the zero vector that makes it the, sub, the subspace. Now, what that means is, is all the non-zero elements of v lambda are exactly the eigenvectors of t corresponding to lambda. Now, it might be that v lambda is just the zero vector, which means that lambda is not an eigenvalue, and therefore it doesn't have any eigenvectors corresponding to it. But if there are any non-zero vectors in v lambda, they are eigenvectors of t corresponding to lambda. Um, and just as, as I said, the, the, the test of whether or not lambda is an eigenvalue is just whether or not the subspace is the zero subspace or not. So this zero subspace tells you, uh, I mean, not this zero subspace, v lambda tells you whether or not lambda is an eigenvalue and also gives you a sense of how big um, the collection of eigenvectors associated with lambda are. Um, well, what dimension do they have? Okay, and, and the thing that I've already mentioned before is that v lambda is the null space of lambda i minus t. Now, uh, in, in the previous slide, I talked about matrices. This is slightly different because this is a linear transformation, but it's exactly the same idea. i v is the identity linear transformation, the one that sends every vector uh, to itself. When you multiply that by lambda, that's also linear transformation. It's the linear transformation that sends every vector to lambda times v. And when you subtract t from that, you also get a linear transformation. And so that linear transformation has a kernel, has a null space, and v lambda is that kernel. So um, even if you're not thinking about it as matrices, you can think of v lambda as the null space, which is another reason, by the way, that v lambda is a subspace because it's the, it's the kernel of a linear transformation. Finally, we can use the rank nullity theorem or the dimension theorem. Um, the dimension of V lambda, because it's the dimension of this null space, dimension of the kernel, it's also a dimension of V minus the rank of that thing. Rank plus um, nullity equals the dimension of uh, the domain. And so the dimension of V lambda is going to be dimension of V minus the rank of lambda I minus C. And sometimes finding rank is a lot easier than finding um, the null space, uh, the dimension of the null space, the nullity. And so we will use this often. And in fact, this is the additional thing that this lecture is bringing to the table, is that by thinking of eigenspaces, we can use this, um, we can use the rank nullity theorem effectively. So before we go on, let me just uh, remind you of the relationship between linear operators, the, the eigenvectors of linear operators and their matrices. So if V is a vector space with dimension N um, and you um, have a linear operator, you can pick bases for your vector space V. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of two different bases, S, and I'm thinking of that as the old basis. May, old basis, maybe that's, that's the standard basis if V has a standard basis, and B as a new basis uh, for V. Then what you can do is you can find the matrix of T with respect to S and S. So when we say the matrix of T with respect to S, we mean we're using this old basis S for both the domain and the codomain, and you can get um, a matrix A. Watch the videos on matrices of linear transformations to get details on that. And, um, or you could use the matrix, uh, the basis B for V and V for the domain and the codomain, and then you would get the matrix of a T with respect to B. So you have two different matrices um, for the same vector space. These two matrices could look very different. Um, and in fact, for diagonalization, we like D to be diagonal when A could be just any matrix. If it's diagonalizable, then we could may maybe find that. These two matrices are very different, but they are, they, they are technically what they're called. They're called similar matrices and they have similar properties. And, and what are those? So uh, first of all, what does similar mean? If you uh, find the change of basis matrix from the new to old, the change of basis matrix from B to S. All that means is take elements of B and write them in terms of S and make, uh, write, write their coordinates in terms of S and, and make those your coordinates, uh, uh, the, the, make those your, the columns of your matrix. I, again, uh, watch the video on change of basis matrices. Change of basis are what allows you to change coordinate systems, going from the coordinate system that S provides to the coordinate system that B provides. So, 
Um, um, so if P is the change of basis matrix from new to old, then um, D is P inverse AP. And that's what similarity means, that there's an invertible matrix uh, P such that uh, one is P inverse times the other times, times P. And, and so, how, so, so that, that's just old news from uh, videos on uh, uh, similarity and, 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 and matrices of linear transformations. But what about eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Well, T, A, and D all have the same eigenvalues. And that just follows from what the matrix of a linear transformation does. A matrix of a linear transformation does the job of the linear transformation. So if you multiply it by the coordinates of vectors, you get the coordinates of the image. And so if, um, if uh, something is an eigenvalue for T and there's a corresponding eigenvector, then the same thing to, will be true for A and D. So they have the same eigenvalues. The situation for the eigenvectors needs a little bit more clarity. So if you, if you have an eigenvector for T, then that's an element of the vector space. It's not a column vector. So you can't say that that's also um, an, uh, an eigenvector for A and D, but its coordinates are. So the coordinates of V with respect to S um, uh, is an eigenvector for A, and the coordinates of uh, V with respect to B is an eigenvector for D. For the point is that these two eigenvectors could actually look very different, the eigenvector for A and for D, because those are... Um, because we are writing V in terms of different bases. And so the, the scalars we need, the coordinate vectors that we need uh, might be quite different, but they all both come from the same um, vector in that uh, vector space. This is the advantage of thinking of linear transformations and, 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 and vector spaces as opposed to just matrices is that you have in the background, this vector space, this vector, and, and, and what you're seeing, these column vectors that you're seeing as eigenvectors of A and D are just manifestations of those, are just coordinate vectors of that one uh, vector. And so even though the eigenvectors of A and D don't look the same, they really came from the same place. Okay, now we are interested in, um, uh, we are interested in finding bases of eigenvectors. That's what uh, diagonalization is. Watch the video on diagonalization and we're gonna see some examples of that in, in a second. Um, when a matrix walks through the door or a linear, a linear operator walks through the door, we are interested in finding a basis for the vector space or basis for Rn made up of eigenvectors. And that means we need linearly independent eigenvectors. Now the good news, so, so what we wish is that there's a lot of linearly independent eigenvectors. Now the good news is that Eigenvectors like to be in basis too. They're not like fighting this. They, they like to be um, elements of the basis. They're just sort of saying, yeah, I want to be in the basis. And, and, and the way they help, and they help a lot, is by being linearly independent from each other. Now, what I mean by that? So what I mean is that eigenvectors of different eigenvalues can never be dependent on each other. So let me mention this theorem. So if you've got a vector space and if you are a linear operator and if you pick a whole bunch of different eigenvalues, um, lambda one, lambda two, lambda k. Now, for one la same uh, one eigenvalue, you can find a lot of eigenvectors that are linearly dependent on each other. Um, but 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 pick different eigenvalues, and then pick one eigenvector for each of these different eigenvalues. So pick one uh, eigenvector for lambda one, another one for lambda two, and another one for lambda k. And the point is that these will always automatically be linearly independent eigenvectors of different eigenvalues cannot be uh, linearly dependent. This is not obvious and, and it needs a proof. And, um, and I will prove, give the proof in a separate video, the, actually the one following the, this immediately. I just don't want to take the time right now to do the proof, but I urge you to, to watch that proof. Now, one uh, uh, corollary of this is that if you happen, if you have a linear operator on a vector space of dimension N, then when will it be diagonalizable? Well, it'll be diagonalizable if I can find a, um, um, a, um, a basis of eigenvectors for V, a basis of eigenvectors of T for V. And, and, and I, that basis needs to have N different, linear, uh, the, the, the different elements, and those have to be linearly independent because it's gonna be a basis. But if T has N distinct eigenvalues, so if it has a dimension of V is N and T has N distinct eigenvalues. So if V is 47 dimensional, you found that T has 47 different eigenvalues. That doesn't happen to happen, have happened to happen. Um, but, but if that did happen, then you know those guys are eigenvalues. So to be an eigenvalue, you've got to have an eigenvector, 
associated with you. And, and what we just said, the theorem that I didn't prove, but I stated um, that those eigenvectors will all be um, in the linearly independent. And so you will have your n linearly independent um, eigenvectors and therefore T will be diagonalizable. So this is one corollary um, of that fact. So the only times when, when it's possible for, um, polynom for, for a linear operator not to be diagonalizable is if uh, its characteristic polynomial has double or triple root. Because the, when the dimension is n, when and the t goes from v to v, the characteristic polynomial is a polynomial of degree n. And if it had n different roots, then it would be diagonalizable. Actually, this theorem has a more general version um, that I will just mention again, and, and in, I will talk about it a little bit more um, uh, in, in the video on, on the proof, is that if v is a vector space and t is a linear operator, and if you take um, distinct eigenvalues, in the theorem before I said pick one um, uh, vector, one eigenvector for each one of these eigenvalues, and that collection will be linearly independent. You don't have to just take one um, uh, eigenvector for each uh, lambda one. You can just take as many as you can. So in fact, you can take a basis uh, for uh, V lambda one, another one for V lambda two, another one for V lambda K. When you pick a big ba basis for V lambda one, you're picking a bunch of eigenvectors and you're picking a bunch of linearly independent eigenvectors for lambda one and do the same thing for lambda two and do the same thing for lambda K. And though that collection will end up being linearly independent, all of them together. So um, uh, eigenvectors from one, uh, uh, eigenvalue can never be dependent on eigenvectors for another one. And in fact, if you pick the best you can do is to do this, is to pick a basis for V lambda one, a basis for V lambda two, and a basis for V lambda K, and then put them together and you would get linearly independent set, right? linearly independent set, which is a really nice thing when you're trying to find a basis for eigenvectors. So without further ado, let's look at some examples. So here's a matrix. 5 minus 1, 3 is, is the first column, minus 6, 4, but minus 6 is the second column, and minus 6, 2, 4, minus 4 is, 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 the, is the third column. And, um, and, and there's the corresponding linear transformation from R3 to R3, L sub A, which is given by multiplying this matrix by column vectors. So you can think of the linear transformation or matrix. We'll go back and forth between the two, those two. And the question is that, is this matrix diagonalizable or is that linear transformation diagonalizable? Those are the same question. Okay, so what, what I have to do, I reserve judgment on what the eigenvalues are. I don't know what they are, but I find lambda I3 minus A. Uh, the reason I do that is that uh, we have shown in, in previous videos that to have an eigenvalue for lambda i minus, uh, for eigenvalue for a, lambda i minus a has to be not invertible because that's actually the same as saying that there is a solution to ax equals lambda x. That turns out to be the same as that this matrix be not invertible. And the way we decide if this matrix is invertible or not is by looking at its determinant. And its determinant is called the characteristic polynomial of the matrix. Watch the video on characteristic polynomials. So that's the determinant of this. And, and, and if I've not made a mistake, it's lambda minus two squared times lambda minus one. Finding such a determinant is not something you want to do in public. You should do it in the privacy of your home. And, and again, if I haven't done a mistake, that, that's the characteristic polynomial. Now its roots are the eigenvalues. So eigenvalues here are one and two. Now this is a three by three matrix. The linear transformation goes from R3 to R3. I didn't get three different eigenvalues. If I had, I would know already that it's diagonalizable. So now it's, um, it's not clear if it is or not. So V1, the eigenspace for lambda equals one is, uh, is what is that? That's the null space of this lambda, minus, uh, lambda I minus A when lambda is one. If you put lambda equals one, you get I3 minus A. So uh, that's that eigenspace. And V2, uh, the eigenspace for lambda equals two is the null space of two I three minus A again, instead of lambda, I'm quitting two. And the key, then the question is, can I find um, um, enough linearly independent eigenvectors uh, to, I mean, three of them. Can I find three linearly independent eigenvectors in V1 and V2? And from what I said about linear independence, that um, uh, amounts to what the dimensions of these subspaces are. Because if I can find as many elements uh, in a basis for V1 and as any element of the basis V2, I can put them together and that, that will be, those will be linearly independent eigenvectors. So let's start doing that. So for lambda equals one, I minus A is going to be 
Um, this, I, instead of uh, lambda, I put one, and this is the matrix that I got, and I have to find this null space. But before I do that, I can, before I actually get my hands dirty and find null space, that's always sort of a grungy thing to do, um, I, I want to see if I, my matrix is diagonalizable or not. And this is where the rank nullity theorem comes. So what I will say is that, well, what's the null space that I want to ask? But before that, I'm going to ask about the nullity. And, um, and, and to find the nullity, I'll ask what's the rank. And the rank, what could the rank of a, matrix, a three by three matrix be? Well, a priori, without thinking about it, the rank could be zero, one, two, or three. Well, it's not zero because it's not the zero matrix. That's the only matrix that has rank zero. And this guy clearly doesn't, it's not the zero matrix. And so it can't be zero. Uh, could it be three? Three would mean that it's full rank. That would mean that this is invertible. But ah, it can't be invertible because we, the way we found this eigenvalue was to find the values of lambda that make this matrix not invertible. So we also know that's not three. So the only possibilities are one and two. So I'm, I'm saying all of that so that um, you, you realize that finding the rank is actually easy because two up two the, well easier because uh, uh, at least two of the uh, possibilities um, um, are are eliminated. Although if there's a hundred by hundred matrix, eliminating two possibilities is not that much. Uh, but uh, so what's the rank of I minus A? Well, here's one row. Is is this row a multiple of that row? It's not, and therefore the rank is two. And, and so if the rank is two, what's the nullity? Nullity plus rank is the number of columns. So the nullity will be one. So the dimension of V1 is one. So that means that from V1, for eigenvectors for one, I can, I can the best I can hope for, in fact, the thing I can hope for is to get one linearly independent eigenvector for that guy. Now, what about lambda equals two? Same thing, we have, I find two I minus A, I, I find that, that matrix. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, what's the null space? And I'm going to say that instead of that, I'm going to find the nullity. And instead of the nullity, I'm going to find the, uh, the rank. Um, and the rank of this one, I noticed that, well, again, it can't be zero or three, but is it one or two? And in this case, it's actually one. Because if you look at the second row, the other two rows are just a multiple of that. So there's only one linearly independent row. So the rank of this matrix is one. The rank nullity theorem tells me that the nullity is two. So the dimension of V2 is two. So I can find two linearly independent eigenvectors for um, uh, lambda equals two. These two and that one, those three, by that general theorem that I mentioned, will be linearly independent from each other. And so I will have three linearly independent eigenvectors. And that's the key to finding if the matrix is diagonalizable. So A is diagonalizable. Again, if you don't know why that is, just watch the videos, a video on diagonalizability that preceded this video um, about, um, uh, and, 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 and you will be happier. Okay, so it's diagonalizable. But now if I actually wanna know, okay, and I actually know when it's diagonalizable, what the matrix is because I know the eigenvalues. But if I actually wanna diagonalize it, I need to find that matrix P such that P inverse AP is diagonal, then I've got to get my hands dirty and find the null spaces. So, 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 to, if I, so now I want to find the eigenvectors, which is what uh, finding those null spaces means. So for lambda equals one, again, I, I need to find the null space of I minus A. Um, I minus A is, is this matrix here, this three by three matrix, and I really want need to solve um, the system, solving systems is again, something you do in the privacy of your home and not in public. And, and again, if I haven't done a mistake, which I may have, um, the basis for V1, but I know that it's gonna have, it's gonna be one dimensional. I already decided that um, it's gonna be minus three, one, three. And uh, for lambda two, we need the null space of two I minus eight. Those are the eigenvectors. So, so if for V1, multiples of minus three, one, three are all the eigenvectors um, of uh, this uh, matrix A for eigenvalue one. Uh, for um, lambda equals two, we want the null space of two I minus A, and then we have to solve this other system. And here we know that the, uh, the solution is gonna be two dimensional. So when we, when we do elementary row operations, for example, we'll get two free variables. Um, and um, and uh, here's the basis, again, assuming that I have not made a mis mistake. So now I found all the eigenvectors. Eigenvectors for one are multiples of minus three, one, three. Eigenvalues for two are linear combinations of these guys, except for zero. Zero is not uh, um, an eigenvector. Okay, and so here's my basis, uh, my new basis made up of eigenvectors. And, uh, um, and, and then what I do is that, uh, if you think of S as the standard basis, then uh, the matrix of eigenvectors is going to be 
the change of basis matrix from new to old is going to be, uh, if you just make these bases into this uh, matrix, so each one of these is a column of your matrix, then what you really have done is you've run, written these elements in terms of the standard basis, writing in standard of, in term of standard basis, just writing the column vector itself. And so this is the change of basis matrix from um, new basis to the old basis. And, uh, and uh, therefore, P inverse AP, and you can check that, is going to be one, two, two. What's the order of these elements? These are the eigenvalues on the, on, the, on the diagonal. What's the order of them? The first one is going to be the eigenvalue for the first element in the basis, the second one for the second one, and the third one for the third one. Um, so um, it, now, if you don't remember quite why was P inverse APD, or is it P, A, P inverse, or which one it is, always remind yourself by looking at one of these diagrams. So uh, the way we're thinking of it is that A, the matrix A, is sending elements of Rn to Rn using the standard basis. You take uh, the column vector, you multiply it by A, you get something in Rn. And, uh, and D does the same thing, but D is, um, is using the basis B. So, so we are writing the coordinate of a vector um, in B and then multiplying by D and getting the coordinate of the vector, the, the corresponding vector in B as well. A and D are both uh, matrices of the same linear transposition in the background, but they're sort of working with uh, different bases. And how do we co connect these two parts of the diagram with change of basis matrix? So for here, if you wanna go from the top left Rn to the bottom Rn, you use the identity map, but, but you're going from basis with, uh, with respect to uh, B, coordinates with respect to B, to coordinates with respect to S. So you need the change of basis matrix from B to S, from new to old, that will take you down here. Then you can go across A, and then you need to go back up and that's gonna be the change of basis matrix from S to B, which will be the inverse of the original one. So instead of going across the top, you can go um, uh, come down to Rn, go uh, across with A and then go up uh, with P inverse. And so what that means is that um, uh, P inverse AP is D. D is, is, is what happens when you go across. Now, when you go around, the first thing you do is P, and that's why P appears on the, on the right-hand side, because when you take matrices and multiply by column vectors, uh, the right-hand side matrix is the first thing that gets multiplied. Then you multiply by A, and then you multiply by P inverse. Um, if you haven't watched the previous videos, all of these might be sound gibberish. Um, I suggest that you do watch some of them. You need to know what linear, uh, linear transformations are, what the matrices of them are, um, how we read these diagrams and so forth to even know what I'm talking about. So, or vice versa, if you want to write A in terms of D, you can, you can pre-multiply and post-multiply by P and P inverse, and you get that A is P, D, P inverse. Or you can look at the, the diagram and say, instead of going from the bottom left um, to the um, bottom right, which we do by multiplying by A, you can go the other way around. But the other way around, that would mean you do P inverse first, because you've got to go backwards here. That's P inverse. And that's why P inverse on, is on the, on the right-hand side of, of, of this equation. And then you do T and then you do P because you've got to go backwards from that. So you get P, D, P inverse. And, and why would you do that? We've seen this in a previous video, but for example, I'll give you one example of each is used. I might want to find A to the 1000. Now, A was that three by three matrix. It had all those numbers in it, multiplying it by itself a, a thousand times would take some time. Uh, but, but now we know that A is PDP inverse. And so I can just write PDP inverse times itself a uh, hundred to a thousand times. And note that P inverse and P cancel each other, give identity. Identity doesn't really do anything when you multiply it. And so when these two cancel, you get D squared. The next two cancel, you get D cubed. And so at the end of the day, you get PD to the thousand P inverse. And, and you reduce, and, and that, that's very nice. Why? Because the, uh, finding D to a thousand, di diagonal matrix to a thousand is really easy. Um, uh, D was one, two, two. D to a thousand is one to a thousand, due to a thousand, two to a thousand, and the diagonals and zeros everywhere else. And, and so we have reduced multiple, finding A to the thousand, which was multiplying at matrix 8,000 times by itself, by multiplying three matrices. And then that's a lot easier. Okay. So now let's look at another example. This looks just the same and it seems a repeat of the uh, previous one. Spoiler alert, it's not gonna be similar. Um, well, it's not gonna be the same. I shouldn't use similar, similar is a technical word. Okay, so again, this is a linear transformation from R3 to R3 if you wish. Um, is it diagonalizable? 
So I look again, I reserve judgment on what the eigenvalues might be and I write lambda I minus A with lambda as an unknown. And, and I do that because I wanna find the characteristic polynomial of the matrix, which is the determinant of lambda I minus A. And, I did, and, and again, if I haven't made a mistake, you get the same thing as before, lambda minus two squared lambda minus one. And this is a, um, uh, shows you that different matrices can have the same um, characteristic polynomial. And therefore the eigenvalues are one and two. And uh, uh, the eigenspace for lambda equals one is the kernel of I minus A. And uh, the eigenspace for lambda equals two is kernel of two I minus A, uh, the null space of those two matrices, just like before. Now, um, we, the, the thing is that, um, the point is that, now this, this is something that needs proof and I'm not about to prove the two, but um, uh, when you have a characteristic polynomial and if you have a factor lambda minus one, uh, so one uh, is the root of this characteristic polynomial with multiplicity one, then the dimension of that null space um, the dimension of this uh, the, the null space of I minus A, this eigenspace is always going to be one. But when, when you have lambda minus two, two squared or cubed or to the fourth, then all bets are off. Uh, then the dimension of that, the corresponding eigenspace could be one, could be two, could be three. Um, I mean, could be up to um, whatever this, um, this exponent is. And, and that's what decides whether or not you've got uh, diagonalizability or not. Okay, so let's get started. For lambda equals one, I minus A is that. I, I'm gonna go a little bit faster because um, um, we have done this before. So again, what's the nullity? Instead of the nullity, I look at the rank and I see that the rank is two. Again, it can't be three, so I don't really have to worry about it. And I see two linearly independent uh, rows. And so the rank is two, that means the nullity is one, the rank nullity theorem, so dimension of V1 is one. So this is not a surprise. I already knew that, although we have never proved that, that uh, dimension of that V1 because the characteristic polynomial had exponent one, lambda minus one to the one um, is one. Um, the, the, the mystery one is lambda equals two, two I minus A is this guy. Again, I, I'm gonna ask you what the, what the rank is and the rank of this one is two as well. And so again, by rank knowledge to the uh, dimension of the eigenspace is, is one, which means that I'm only gonna get one linearly um, independent um, eigenvector for this other one as well, for both V1 and V2. So the best I can do is to find two linearly independent eigenvectors. And that tells me that, um, uh, that the matrix is not diagonalizable. So I'm not gonna even bother uh, go forward. Now, um, in, in more advanced linear algebra classes, you don't stop there and you, um, you, you have other forms other than that diagonal form. Instead of diagonal say, well, what if I can put a one over here? Can I, can I make it almost diagonal? Uh, but not, and there are things called Jordan form and rational form and so forth, uh, where, where you prove that uh, um, many matrices, maybe all matrices, you can do that given certain conditions. Okay. Um, now, um, so, so we had two matrices that looked the same. One of them was diagonal as well, one what was not. Um, but what can go wrong? Why is a matrix not diagonalizable? Well, um, it could be that... Uh, uh, you're looking in the wrong place. So for example, it could be that the characteristic polynomial that you want to solve doesn't have any, uh, any real um, uh, roots or, or has real roots, but not enough of them because some of them are complex numbers. So for example, if the characteristic polynomial was lambda squared plus one, um, it wouldn't have any real roots. It would have complex roots, but not real roots. That's a, that's a problem with the real numbers. It's not really a problem with the matrix. The matrix wants to have eigenvalues and, and, and be diagonalizable in that case, possibly. But, but, but the problem isn't um, as with the real numbers, that, 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 that polynomial does not have enough roots in the real numbers. And the answer is, and the solution to that is to uh, think broad, more broadly and, and bring in the complex numbers. And that's why you know, complex numbers are helpful, even when you are worried about only real things and, and, and real numbers. Um, because sometimes matrices with just real entries will have complex numbers that are their angular values and, and complex eigenvectors that, for example, you can use to find A to a thousand, um, um, uh, make a detour to complex numbers and then come back to real numbers. So, um, and over complex numbers, you will never have this problem that uh, uh, polynomials do, do not have roots. That's called the, that's called the uh, uh, fundamental theorem of algebra that says that every polynomial will have a root and can be completely factored over the complexes. For that, you need uh, to look at uh, maybe my videos on, the, on, on, on uh, abstract algebra. 
but uh, but but because of that, if you um, uh, in, envision the world where your scalars are complex numbers and and use those, you'll never run into this problem that uh, 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 your characteristic polynomial doesn't have um, uh, roots or doesn't have enough roots. But the problem might be that it has roots, but they are double or triple or quadruple roots, like the ones we saw, lambda minus two squared. So then two is a root, it's the root twice. So a polynomial of degree n should have n roots, but uh, and over complexes, they will have n roots, but, but some of those roots might be, um, have multiplicity more than one or two. So that could be the other problem. But, but if you think about that, <clears throat> How that it can happen? If you have a polynomial, how can it have a double root? To have a double root, you will have to be tangent uh, to the x-axis. Um, so so your, your polynomial came down, and instead of crossing the x-axis, it was tangent to it. To have a triple root, it would have to sort of have an inflection point on, on, that, um, um, uh, on, on the x-axis. And those things um, are, are sort of quite fragile in the sense that if you change your polynomial just a little bit, perturb it a little bit, then it'll be off being a tangent, and then it will not have, uh, uh, it will either have complex roots or you bring it down and then you'll have double roots. Um, uh, you have two roots, not double roots anymore. So if you start with a matrix um, um, A and, uh, and, it, and, and it has double roots or triple roots, the characteristic polynomial does, then all you, do, you have to do is perturb A a little bit, like change the, one of the entries just a tad, and, and then um, it won't. And so if you perturb a bit, bit and you see a scalars, then A will be diagonalizable. So, um, so if you have a square matrix, most likely it's diagonalizable because just a little bit of perturbation makes it diagonalizable as long as you use um, the scalar C. Um, and so that's why um, diagonalizable matrices are, are, are the way to think about matrices. So uh, if you're thinking about a, um, a, a theoretical thing or a practical thing, you might as well assume that a matrix is diagonalizable, even though linear algebra has plenty of tools to deal with non-diagonalizable matrices. And sometimes you really do have to think about non-diagonalizable matrices. Uh, but, in, in, but in practice, like for example, matrices that come from economics or chemistry or physics, where, um, where the data that goes into that matrix is approximations anyway, and so they're sort of perturbed anyway already, chances are they're diagonalizable. Or if not, just change it a little bit. That's the end of this lecture. See you in the next one.